Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. With us is writer Marie Brenner, a true chronicler of our time. Over the past three decades, she's been a featured writer for Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. She has covered, among other things, Donald Trump and Roy Cohn, the rise of anti-Semitism in France, and the Bernie Madoff, BCCI, and Enron financial scandals. Becoming part of the story, she made news years ago when, at a gala black tie event at Tavern on the Green, Donald Trump poured a glass of wine down her back because he didn't like something she had written. He walked away. Her articles have attracted filmmakers. Her piece on tobacco insider Jeffrey Wigand, the man who knew too much, inspired the movie The Insider, starring Russell Crowe and Al Pacino. The film was nominated for seven Academy Awards. Lately, she has turned her hand to filmmaking, where she produced two movies, the first intriguingly entitled A Private War, is a dramatization of the life of legendary London Times foreign affairs correspondent Marie Colvin, killed in 2012 in Homs, Syria, while reporting the conflict. One of her Vanity Fair articles inspired the film. The second, in which she appears on camera, is a documentary about the career of lawyer fixer mob conciliary Roy Cohn, called Where's My Roy Cohn, scheduled for 2019 release at the Sundance Film Festival. We are pleased to welcome the extraordinary Marie Brenner to this table. <laughs> now, Marie, tell us something about your background. You're not a native New Yorker. I grew up in San Antonio. San Antonio, Texas. And I was so lucky because I had a father who threw me into public affairs from the time I was a child. The conversation at our table was, the mayor is co corrupt, the governor is corrupt, the senator is corrupt. Other fathers played tennis. Not mine, much has changed since. <laughs> mine <laughs> helped whistleblowers come out of, of uh, hiding. Had whistleblowers came out of hiding. So uh, what was your uh, education? Did you, uh, go I to went to in public Texas? school. I went to public school in San Antonio. Then I came to the East and I went to college. And then I went back and graduated from the University of Texas and came right to New York and uh, went to graduate school in film and went to work. So you went to graduate school in filmmaking. Absolutely. And what, was, what a time to be in graduate school. There, Nixon was in the White House. It was like an, un, a, an unspooling movie all the time, as if, as if we're living in this era once again. Well, and uh, history repeats itself. Absolutely. And uh, here we are once again at a time of utter moral larceny. What about uh, your interest in financial reporting? Uh, where did that come from? Well, BCCI, Enron, Madoff? So I've always been attracted to people who are caught up in extraordinary situations and particularly who have been undone by scoundrels. And what got to me about the Enron case was the accountants who were, who were wrapped in this web, who were being called upon to do crooked things for the head of the company, Ken Lay. And at once at one of the briefings, I saw a woman who actually turned out to be the whistleblower in the case, a very brave accountant, run out of a courtroom in the hearing. So I just followed her out and discovered a kind of remarkable tale of how she had been a witness to all of this corruption that had gone on in the company. Okay, so uh, then uh, you had um, a sibling, didn't you, a brother? Yes, I had an older brother who was, uh, we, were, we were called Apples and Oranges in our family. In fact, I wrote a book with that which title. Which was which? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> we were complete opposites. My brother, marvelous lawyer, litigator, became an apple orchardist, and he was extremely conservative. He would not have been a Trump supporter. He was a, he was a very, very conservative, uh, almost like a libertarian kind of person. And he was the youngest person who was a member of the NRA in the state of Texas. This is kind of the kind of childhood I had. So we were complete opposites. Was he there a went, gun in your household? There were many guns. My fa we were a family of hunters. They were deer hunting every weekend. They would go to Africa to go big game hunting. Now, we were definitely a gun family. But it was the days before the NRA, when the NRA was still about safety regulations. So all the gun cabinets were locked. Everything was safe. We cared very much about gun safety, but definitely a family of hunters. Your book uh, is about the sibling relationship, isn't it? And Absolutely. particularly how to repair or maintain a sibling relationship. Now, what's your advice to those that have 
uh, fractured or delicate <laughs> relations with siblings. Uh, and you know, it turns out siblings are a, a, a kind of a common situation. There's only about 60% of people who have very good relationships with their brothers and sisters. About 30% of people have what I had, which wasn't, it isn't so terrible, but you have you know, a problem. You know, like Ram Das said, if you think you're enlightened, spend a few days with your family. <laughs> and we are in that kind of percentage. Um, Every situation is individual, and usually a case of siblings, uh, in my own situation, it was that we couldn't really see each other. And our great task became, as we got into- You mean see each other physically? As people, as, oh, as, as people. people. We couldn't listen to each other. And as we got into our, our sort of middle age, and my brother developed a very rare disease at a quite young age, we, we were pulled together and it was a kind of extraordinary time in my life because I learned who he was and who he really was and I think he would say it the same for me and it was um, quite um, it was really quite a struggle but I'm it was a very um, it was a it was a very important and kind of necessary uh, thing and you have some interesting words of advice for those that would like to repair relationships <laughs> with siblings. Uh, uh, I remember uh, rule number one was get on a plane. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, don't be afraid. Rule number two is don't wait for a crisis. And don't be afraid of being. Don't don't worry about anger and try to understand what's being said through the anger, the yearning underneath the anger. Okay, so we go from uh, siblings. Uh, to Marie Colvin. How did you get interested in Marie Colvin? Did somebody on the desk at Vanity Fair <laughs> said, uh, call you and say, Marie, write about Marie Colvin? Uh, close to it. I was in Kenya, actually, doing at an elephant preserve, reporting on elephants. And I got a call from Graydon Carter. Marie Colvin had just been killed in Syria. Can you get to London? Did and you know Marie Colvin? We shared friends in common, but we didn't know each other. But I had, of course, I admired her like everyone in the world did. And I flew right to London, and all of her friends were so raw, as you can only imagine. People were trying to understand what had happened. And on the very first day I got there, I was at the Frontline Club where the foreign correspondents gather, and there was her photographer, Paul Conroy, who had too been blown up in Syria and had had his leg very, very badly hurt. And Paul- and He was beside her almost when oh, she He was died. beside her. And he, Paul came from the hospital with his IV pole and stood up and spoke about Marie without even hesitating for about an hour. And it was so extraordinary to hear about not only her bravery and her desire to bear witness, but also her exhilaration, the fun she had as a reporter, the um, joy she took to being the young reporter who had gone to Gaddafi's palace in the early 80s, pretending to be French, breaking away from all the pack. And Gaddafi made a pass at her. Oh, Gaddafi used to have her wear long green silk robes and little gold shoes, or ask her to. And once he had a nurse bring a hypodermic needle to try and draw her blood, and that at that point, Marie fled Libya and got on a plane and uh, fled Libya, but got the scoop of her life, which got her hired by the Sunday Times. And of course, she became probably one of the greatest re war reporters of... Uh, Certainly the, since the, Martha Gellhorn. Absolutely, who was her idol. Uh, now, uh, she wore a signature uh, eye patch over her left eye. <laughs> uh, a necessary eye patch, so a necessary it, eye patch. became part of her persona along with uh, the uh, pearl of bras. And, uh, <laughs> and the pearl, and the pearls, the pearls that she had been given by her father when she graduated. In a combat zone. Yeah. And, uh, and the camouflage sweaters that came from who knows where. Marie took a lot of chances and one of them happened in Sri Lanka. Uh, and she, she had gone to cover an uprising and to try and uh, interview the, the head of the Tamil Tiger. And while she was there, she was told, do not go out, do not leave, you know, the, the militia compound. But she was following a, the, the Tamil tiger head, and she was blown up and lost her eye. Uh, and when she, it was the first time that she realized journalists could be under attack, when she had a big uh, sign on her back. She always had gaffer tape on her back that said press. And she yelled, she, she jumped up and she said, you know, reporter, press. And then instead they just put a rocket right at her and lo she lost her eye. Uh, now, uh, she, uh, 
had this loss of an eye, this grievous wound. I mean, did she suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder? Very, very badly. In fact, if you, when you see a private war, Rosamund Pike is so extraordinary. This is the film. The film. The, Rosamund Pike is so extraordinary, taking in the pain of Marie and the, the addiction and how she dealt with it and what she felt. I think it's one of the first movies that actually uses the kind of moral injury that reporters suffer in the field as uh, an element of a film, where you really feel uh, what it is for someone who really cares about telling the story of victims. There's one extraordinary moment where you see her in Iraq, where bodies are being dug up, bodies that Saddam has killed. And there's a Matthew Heineman, who, this is his first feature. He's done this astonishing scene where he Well, he actually, was a documentary filmmaker. He came, he, he had, This was his first narrative. He had film. been nominated for a, a, an Oscar for Cartel Land, and he made the film about the reporters in Raqqa called City of Ghosts. And Matthew was determined to have that kind of authenticity of what Marie Colvin actually felt and experienced in the field. So in this particular scene, which I think you will find so moving. There is a, a whole scene of Iraqi widows who are waiting to see this mass grave being dug up, one of Marie's great scoops. Their husbands have been killed, their sons. They don't know where they are. And suddenly you see these women sobbing at once. And all of these women were in fact found in refugee camps and had really gone through what they had gone through. So, so they weren't actors. They weren't actors. And when the and Matthew spent weeks finding them. And, and in every scene that is shot in the Middle East, the same kind of situation. He wanted it to be utterly authentic. Um, there's a final scene uh, that takes place where Marie is blown up in Syria in the town of Holmes in Baba Amir, where he put in the clinic where she had gone to report, you may have seen her on CNN with this baby who had been, uh, had been massacred in this uh, rocket attack by Bashar al-Assad. And just before the filming started, he had Rosamund Pike go into the clinic, and she didn't know, but inside the clinic were all refugees who had gone through a version of this. And he said- Now this wasn't in Syria, this was in This was, uh, in this was Jordan, shot in Jordan, in but Jordan. he had made it, and, and they had a moment of reverence on the set, like a sort of like to sort of bring back the emotion. Paul Conroy, the photographer, was on set every day working as a consultant. And then before the cameras rolled, Rosamund Pike actually went with her notebook and began hearing all of the stories. So the scene that you see is so vivid, it's almost like a documentary. Uh, now, uh, Rosamund Pike said she wanted to be as much as uh, like Marie Colvin as was possible. So. It said she wore her eye patch uh, on the set, uh, even when she was off camera. Her preparation was incredible for this. One of the things that she did, which I found so moving, is she wanted to experience what fear was actually like. So she went to um, an NGO in Lebanon for several weeks that actually went out looking for mines and was in the field w looking around for mines to feel that fear of what Marie would feel in the in the field and this kind of the the kind of preparation she did was incredible she walked with an eye patch to know what it was with a balance she interviewed and spoke to at length d oh a, dozens of Marie's friends and colleagues and the night before that she shot in in Syria and sorry, in Jordan, the first day of shooting, she got on the phone with someone who she hadn't spoken with before, one of Marie's closest friends that she'd gone to Yale with, uh, Katrina Heron, and spoke to her for hours on the phone uh, to try and find out every single thing more that she could. Now, Marie Colvin uh, was uh, killed in 2012, and she was I mean, roughly 55 years old at the time, uh, while Rosamund Pike was 40. Uh, Marie Colvin came from Long Island. Rosamund Pike is a British actress. Uh, was it an issue fitting her into the role? I mean, did she have to take uh, dialect lessons to speak American rather than, uh, than English? It, We're she's... divided by a common language, <laughs> it's been said. She's a woman of such fierce intelligence. You know, I had seen her in her movie United Kingdom where she plays the, the British uh, girl who marries the prince, the African prince. 
And at one point I thought during this movie, oh my God, she looks so much like the young Marie Colvin, and she does, and she moved like her. And it turned out quite ironically that she had been trying to meet Matthew to try, she wanted to play this part so much. And she began writing these extraordinary emails about Marie and the character of Marie and what she could bring to it. And she truly inhabits her as an actress. It's a remarkable performance. It was written at a time when surely uh, journalists were under attack. And uh, your article was written, and it continued uh, during the course of the filmmaking, uh, Enemies of the People. And then even after the film came out, the Khashoggi incident, uh, is the film supposed to be a metaphor for uh, uh, journalists being threatened either uh, verbally or physically because they're reporting to us the news. I mean, there are uh, real-time historians. It became for all of us working on the movie a mission. And Jim, you are so right to point this out. When when we the script was being rewritten and rethought about, Trump was running for president, and he was starting his grievous attacks on reporters. So we were in a surreal situation where, in real time, we had an actual presidential candidate calling us the enemy of the people, threatening reporters at his rallies. You saw CNN reporters gathering up their laptops, scurrying in this red-faced rage, and then a movie was being prepared about a reporter who, who braved this kind of situation every day to get out into the field to talk about real victims and real people, the people who put their lives in danger every day. And there were reporters that were being slaughtered in real time. For the first time, you had reporters who were being targeted, as Marie Colvin was, by Bashar al-Assad. Her sister is suing uh, the Bashar Syrian al government. The Syrian, the Syrian government. government. You had reporters who were being targeted just because they were trying to report the truth. And so, for all of us, it really became a mission, but particularly for our director, Matthew Heineman, who had just come from making City of Ghosts about the reporters who were living underground in Raqqa, who came out and were the ones who were tweeting what was happening, who then wound up in Turkey. So it's a suggestion that Marie Colvin uh, was targeted by Assad because she was uncovering the ruthless murder of children and women and non-combatants. There's no question about it. She was bracketed by him. She had been warned not to use her sat phone because she could be targeted by Assad's forces. And she was in Holmes as it was under attack in the town of Baba Amir. She came out under a tunnel and then she went back in and her photographer, Paul Conroy, told her, we will be killed. But she at that point was so obsessed with getting the story out and also so overwhelmed with her PTSD and the sorts of the mission that drove her there that she wound up a day later and was indeed on the phone with Anderson Cooper and at CNN on her sat phone when the, the, she, the next day they were targeted. And she was killed. So let's move on to uh, a no less tragic subject, Roy Cohn. <laughs> uh, you covered Roy Cohn. Uh, but you know the two of them you they they are one one is about speaking the truth about moral larceny and the other embodies mar moral larceny so you now, could so not have you a more poor more paradoxical co combination okay so tell tell those who were born a little more <laughs> recently than i was about roy cohn <laughs> roy cohn is perhaps one of the mo uh, most uh, influentially evil characters of the latter half of the 20th century. He was uh, an ambitious young lawyer who had grown up uh, in a family where his father was a judge up in a, uh, the Bronx, and he came out of the democratic machine politics of America. He'd gone to the best schools. He was a prodigy. He'd gone to Horace Mann in New York. He'd gone to Columbia Law. He used to brag that he was the youngest graduate of Columbia Law School, but of course that was a lie. He was one of the youngest graduates. Mm -hmm. And he was almost immediately, he became a kind of a darling. He was a uh, a, sort of a repressed character. He became a kind of a darling of the gossip columnist who reigned supreme at 
the Stork Club in the, that era. And they, that would have been Leonard Lyons, it would have been George Sikulski, and they helped get him a job in the prosecutor's office of the Manhattan, D, at the, uh, the, the Southern District at the time that the Rosenbergs uh, were being uh, uh, accused of being spies. And he became a young prosecutor going after the Rosenbergs on a spy case. And he saw his moment and he took it. He helped um, get Ethel Rosenberg electrocuted in a, in a spy case which galvanized the country at that time in the early 50s. And divided the country. And divided the country. There were protests every day on the street. And Roy Cohn became drunk with his power and then went to work for Senator Joe McCarthy who had made a career out of lying and accusing many people in the State Department uh, of being communists when of course they weren't. And one of this was all p p political machinations of the kind that we are living through again today. It was the worst kind of scoundrel time. America loves witch hunts. America loves its big scoundrels. And Roy Cohn and Joe McCarthy embodied that scoundrel time. There was a famous moment where Joe McCarthy, running for re-election for Senate, read a list, held up a list and said, I have 250 mem members of the Communist Party in the State Department. Of course, all of it was just a complete fake. There wasn't a list, there weren't names. You know, he just made it up. And you know, it's, it's hard to imagine right now, but Roy Cohn, who was, became Donald Trump's lawyer at the end of his life. And so McCarthy uh, finally is censured by the Senate and uh, his, uh, he's really in disgrace. And Cohn uh, leaves Washington where he was helping McCarthy, and he returns to New York where he becomes a lawyer in private practice. And he, tr and he tries to remake his career, which he does brilliantly as a fixer. But before that, during this couple of years that the McCarthy period reigned, you had this heavy-lidded little figure who looked exactly like Donald Trump's Stephen Miller. Very, they could be, it was, they, they look like separated at birth. And you see him in the pictures whispering into the ear of Joe McCarthy. And you see him belittling people who would, some of them, some people actually committed suicide after they had been smeared by his committee. They lost their jobs. They had no way to support themselves. To be in any way affiliated with Russia, some irony, right? To be in any way affiliated with Russia, to have anything to do with the Communist Party in that period, was to have your life ruined in America in this witch now, hunt time. Cohn was gay. And, and he operated out of but a townhouse on 68th but Street. But he was he never admitted it, even at the end even of his to life. The very end. Yeah. And he died of AIDS in and, 1986. And one of the most uh, egregious things he did was he, besides you know, going after people who were alleged communists, was he also targeted gay men in Washington, and he would put them in front of that the committee. That was the lavender investigation. The la because if you, were con if you were homosexual in the Washington of that period, you were considered a security risk. So the idea of, of you know, the, the moral larceny in all of this is so astonishing. You also reported on the relationship between uh, Cohn and Donald Trump. Well, it was extraordinary to see them in a room together. They were obsessed with each other. Trump met Cohn when he was a young, sort of a young builder around town, trying to like enhance his reputation. His father had, you know, famously had been accused of uh, racist housing practices, and there was a Justice Department suit brought against him. So and against Trump too. Yeah, and against Trump too. And he he meets Roy Cohn at Le Club, which was a kind of. Uh, place where people, you know, sort of like uh, society Euro trash would go uh, in that era. And he said, well, you know, my father is being accused of this, we're being accused. And, and, and Cohn gave his three rules, attack, 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 never admit, and we'll sue them. And, you know, the irony of this is, you know, they try, he said, you're my lawyer, that's what we want. So the next day or soon after, they call a, pre he gets hired, 
they decide this crazy strategy. They're going to call a press conference and, you know, they're going to announce that they're going to sue the Justice Department. For Counterclaimed against the government. Now, so, you know, like in the first week of law school, you know, you learn, you know, you cannot, the last thing you can do is sue the Justice Department. Like any first week law student knows this, but of course, the, the more outrageous the tactic, the better. And it So was anyway, you write about this and we're on the verge of wrapping up, but uh, you write about this and uh, what do you get for your efforts? Uh, Trump uh, <laughs> drops a, a, a glass of wine down the back of your dress. <laughs> well, earlier I had written that I had I had learned that 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 Trump had kept Hitler's speeches by his bed, and had written about this at some length in Vanity Fair, and that's what really got to him. It was the Hitler speeches. The Hitler speeches. Okay, so I have a question for you. You've uh, been a, a star reporter a star author, a star <laughs> filmmaker. What's next for Marie Brenner? <laughs> I think I want to do what Marie Colvin did and go and go out and tell yet more stories. The more it's always it's for I for, it's the next story is what I'm always well, looking for. Don't get uh, blown up and uh, and keep your back dry. <laughs> Marie Brenner, this has been marvelous. Thank, thank you, you so much for coming by and thank you for coming by. <laughs> Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.